All right, Tony, you feeling good? You ready to go? I'm ready if you guys are. Let's do it. Right. So I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out to this uh, virtual reading, uh, speaking of survival. Um, super happy to be a part of this. Thanks to Reagan for putting everything together. Thanks to the readers for uh, participating and being here. Uh, only totally started because Brandon and I wanted to bring uh, the sort of community aspect that we come to love with writing uh, into like a magazine form. So this is definitely the type of thing we imagined. Um, I did a, a writing workshop for veterans for many years. I totally believe in uh, the magic of communal storytelling and uh, sharing your art in a manner like this. Um, it's really special to me. Uh, happy to uh, do this to raise money for resilience. Um, I don't want to say too much more. I'll just give it to Reagan and the rest of you guys to share your work with us. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to have Only Magazine as the host. Um, as Tony mentioned, um, Only was created in the spirit of community open reading. Uh, the forever old act, uh, as their website indicates, of giving yourself to those around you. Um, so the magazine aims to showcase poetry and prose with sincere intention, um, work, works that forego aesthetic goals and academic conventions to offer an honest perspective to others. Uh, only seeks writing that lives in the labor, takes long breaths, words that still have the dirt in them, which always makes me crack up because it just reminds me of that, you know, rub some dirt in it thing. <laughs> Um, but I, but I like it, uh, you know, and only, uh, was very, very welcoming, um, of this project, uh, when I pitched it as part of their 5,000 pitches, um, call last year. So we've had this in the works for a while. Um, so, uh, as Tony already did, but I will reiterate, uh, welcome to Speaking of Survival. I am Reagan. I am not Brandon. Brandon is the other, um, editor and founder at Only Magazine, who can't be with us today, but uh, he's here in spirit and his name is on the screen. Um, I am Reagan Petruva. I'm a writer and editor and consultant, and I'm so honored uh, to bring together seven fellow poets, one literary journal only, and one survivor supporting nonprofit, Resilience, for this virtual event and fundraiser to share poetry, to build community, and to spark hope. Uh, thank you for making this happen, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today to create this space. The month of April is both National Poetry Month and Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, and I've been waiting a long time to bring together these two subjects that have impacted my life in a way that I hope, with your help, will assist other survivors in their healing journey. Speaking of survival is designed to give voice to survivorship through poetry, to foster creative permission, inspiration, and collaboration, to provide opportunities for fresh dialogue and deeper literary and broader community connections, particularly among those affected by sexual violence, and to raise funds and direct support of survivors of sexual violence in the Chicagoland area, which is where I was born, and where Resilience, the beneficiary nonprofit of your generous donations, is located. Resilience is an independent, non for profit organization dedicated to the healing and empowerment of sexual assault survivors through non judgmental crisis intervention counseling, individual and group trauma therapy, and medical and legal advocacy in the greater Chicago, land, uh, Chicago metropolitan area. Resilience provides public education and institutional advocacy in order to improve the treatment of sexual assault survivors and to affect positive change in policies and public attitudes towards sexual assault. Resilience envisions a world where prevention efforts and global awareness of sexual violence expose rape myths, remove stigmas, eliminate rape, and support all people as equal members of society. Due to the nature of the subject matter, some of the poetry we'll be sharing today covers, which is sexual violence, we do not recommend this event for audiences younger than 18 or for survivors of sexual violence who are currently experiencing severe mental and or physical health issues related to their survivorship. This being said, any survivor could potentially find themselves triggered by something in today's reading. And with that in mind, we have someone on hand from Resilience, Annalise Castro, who is a trained trauma therapist to assist anyone privately. 
please feel free to reach out to her by selecting her name specifically in the chat and sending her a private direct message. She can also point you in the direction of additional resources outside of this event that you or someone you know may need. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the flow of today's event and some of the stuff to be on the lookout for afterwards. We have eight poets reading today, Kiana Towns, Maggie Royer, Zoe Faiston, Madeline Barnes, Lanny Stabile, Avery Guess, and myself. I'll introduce you to each of them before they read and let you know about which auction packages they're offering. And we'll share that information as well in the chat so you can be on the lookout when you visit the link in the event that uh, particular reader's work especially resonates with you. After all of us poets have read, Annalise will guide us through a grounding ceremony. Sometime after the event, we'll share the, rec the video recording so you can revisit and share with us others if you'd like. The fundraiser itself will remain open through the month of April, so if you haven't yet donated or aren't in the position to do so today but would like to, the link will still be live for you to do so. I'd also like to at this time tell you a bit about the packages we have up for auction that Only specifically has provided. Only is offering two mystery swag packages, one at the $50 level and the other at the $250 level, which is for the 21-year-old-plus uh, crowd because it contains some adult beverages, among other things. Um, Tony, would you like to tell us a bit more about the mystery packages, uh, perhaps maintaining some of the mystery, perhaps not? Uh, yeah, I can maintain the mystery because Brandon set those up and I don't know what they are. Um, but I assume it involves merch, probably um, our coffee that we've made in collaboration with Youngstown Coffee Co. Um, there is a beer we made with Modern Methods Brewery, a, a brewery in Youngstown. I assume that's involved in the, uh, the one for adults. Um, <laughs> maybe um, some issues or some uh, of the anthologies we've done. I'm really, it's a mystery to me too, so. <laughs> okay. Um, but our... it'll be cool, it'll be cool. Right on, right on. Um, we also have with us today um, our friends at Kid Books um, who offered some auction packages for this event as well. Um, today we have with us one of their founding editors, Catherine Blair, to tell us more about Kit, about Kith and their auction packages. So let me see, um, Catherine, are you able to unmute yourself or do you need? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Hello. Hi. I was, I, I was, I had my video off because I was running around my house trying to find copies of the books that are in the, in the packages. And I mostly did. Um, okay, so I'm Catherine Blair from uh, Kith Publishing, and we are um, published mo at this point mostly poetry collections, although there are a couple of novels coming, they just take longer. And um, we are both survivors, um, both my brother and I who run the press, and, um, and local to the area. So it was this specifically interesting um, to me when uh, this came up in front of me from Regan, I wanted to uh, participate. I put out a call to the Kith um, authors, so the whole Kith fam, and uh, everyone came back and said that their book was available um, to join one of the bundles, which was overwhelming. Uh, so what we did is went through and put together a couple of groups, and I've titled them Bodies, 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 and um, trans, queer, and here. We are not specifically a trans press, but we tend to get, because of the, um, we started as a lit mag called corporeal and then grew into engendered when we realized how many of the stories of embodiment that were coming to us were trans stories or stories about some kind of, with some kind of gender component. Um, that ended up blowing out into its own mag. People sort of, grew their way through us. And now a lot of those contributors are bringing their books to Kef, um, feeling like they've found a place that sort of uh, is a home for those stories and those voices. So uh, those are the two. In Bodies, 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 we have Adrian Frandel's Book of Extraction, which was such a fun book to make for me because it's really for me. It's about teeth. Um, and so we got a ton of messages. We did and Adrian did people who really wanted the book, but also really thought they would never be able to open the book or read any of the poems in the book. Engage with it. It's like making a whole book about feet or something. It's really divisive. Um, and Sloan Angelou's book is the first book we made. It's called 12 Ways to Occupy My Body. And there's another one coming from Sloan uh, very shortly that's a companion piece, which is kind of fun. 
Uh, Nat Rom made the uh, the fine line um, with us, which is a fun exploration, a return to a bunch of poems that were written quite a long time ago, and then um, some erasure work done on them. Sterling Elizabeth's Arcadia, uh, Sterling Elizabeth Arcadia's Heaven at Phrases is um, the book about pop culture. It's a lot about Spider-Man and it's a lot about living in a trans body. And um, if that sounds intriguing to you, you should definitely check it out. And then two comics from Kimball Anderson. And uh, one is body comic and one is um, what a body. And they're really, um, I mean, I have body comic here with me, but they're very cute, one in full color and one um, in the black and white there, pencil sketches. And um, in trans queer in here, just a cool thing that I noticed that I hadn't noticed until I put these together is, or like got them together to show them to you guys is, this is the bodies set and this is the trans queer in here set. And I don't know if you've noticed, but this is bright and gorgeous and I'm really in love with that collection there. Um, some fun ones here, Lacuna from Tommy Blake. Um, what if you wrote poetry when you were 16 or 17 and then came back to it at 23? How would you feel about it? Um, these have been reworked, um, but really preserve that feeling of being 16 or 17 in a fun way. Stray Levant's Icarus Rising is a gorgeous book that I really liked making and that Stray's um, artwork on the front as well, which is fun. Um, Utopia in Green from Maggie Sumter is just sapphic joy, which we don't get to see quite a lot of or as much of as I'd like to um, coming through the door. That one's good. Clem Flowers, Snakeskin Stockings. And again, there's another Clem Flowers coming soon. And then this one that I'm just in love with is um, Gwendolyn Harper's Flying the Jolly Scarlet, Gambling with the Gods. And if you want to read poetry from a uh, trans woman in her 50s, a lifelong sex worker, and mostly unhoused through most of her adult life, this stuff is wild. Um, she's angry and defiant, and I spent an amazing afternoon with her in Seattle recently that was a lot of fun. Um, so those are them. And then the other package is that uh, I am putting myself, making myself available to help someone get their book. Uh, together. So if someone has a book or I mean, you can bring it, we say you can bring us your work as messy as you like. We get lots of submissions that have to be like put back together so that I can read them um, uh, from the start. We try to meet you where you are. We're both trans mad and crypt queer and uh, we work on crypt time and we work the way that you need to work um, to get your stuff together. So we will take um, your messy collection of words and or artwork and um, I'll walk you through it how it goes all the way from there to a book that you can hold um, I'm excited about that one so I'm hoping that one's going to be fun and that's the experience if you come uh, through Kith if you send us your book we do a really handhold we want you to leave our press knowing how it works and knowing that you can feel confident taking something to another press and feeling like you understand the process enough to hold your own there um, I think it's scary to go into something that you don't understand. So the goal is to leave our press understanding it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Reagan, for this. I'm excited about the reading. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> and thank, thank you again for your generosity. I mean, you and only both, um, as well as our readers. I mean, everybody's just been super generous uh, with uh, just different packages, different ideas to offer people, all of it. 100% of these donations are going to resilience to support um, fellow survivors. So we, we're not, you know, we're not getting anything except the, the joy of being able to help fellow survivors in this way. Um, so thank you for your patience, everyone, while we kind of covered some of the business aspect. Um, we are now going to get to the poetry. So um, don't be alarmed. There may be times where I turn off my video and or sound. Um, so I'm taking care of some behind the scenes business. Uh, please don't be alarmed if that's the case. I'm still here. I'll pop back on before each subsequent reader so that um, you know we're moving through the event and I'm introducing everybody. Um, so without further ado, our first reader is someone I had the privilege of working with in grad school. Um, part of the same MFA cohort uh, as me, um, Kiana Towns. Kiana is a lifelong resident of North Flint she is a graduate of the Master of Fine Arts program at Bowling Green State University and the Master of Arts program at Central Michigan University. Kiana has been published in various literary journals, including Harvard Review Online. 
In 2016, her poem Behest of a Fading Diva was made into a short film by Motion Poems. In addition to her professional community endeavors, Kiana is mom to two exceptional daughters, Sam and Cass. Kiana, take it away. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Chris, thank you for clapping for me and Avery too. And Madeline, I do see the heart, thank you. Um, as I was sharing with Reagan earlier this week, um, this has been a little tough for me. Um, I am new to writing about my experiences, um, but really happy to find, happy and sad to find community, people willing to um, share their own stories. And so I say thank you to everybody uh, for allowing me to be in this space. Um, and I will be brief, Scouts Honor, um, I'll be on time. I am uh, just going to read very briefly from uh, a prose piece uh, that I published a few years ago. Um, this is sort of helping me to work toward the writing of the poetry. Um, and so uh, I'll go ahead and, and launch in here. It is not an easy thing to discuss. However, as a writer and an advocate, I understand the necessity and the power of sharing our truths. Our stories are a means of unifying and healing our communities and ourselves. They are not always pretty and light. Sometimes there's grit and darkness. There are also times when our stories seem insignificant or irrelevant, but I believe this, there is healing in the telling. And as Bob Dylan once sang, I go right where all things lost are made good again. I had no, I had not created the circumstance, but like so many violated people, I blamed myself. I was mentally and emotionally unprepared to deal with the fallout of sexual assault. I was terrified the person who attacked me would return to take my life. Fear and anger kept me awake at night and mentally paralyzed during the day. I did not know where to begin the process of healing or seeking justice. I had to figure out how to keep the experience from consuming me, except I did not know how to do that either. And so I've um, found this poem by this wonderful poet, Yersa Daly Ward, Daly, D-A-L-E-Y hyphen Ward, in case anybody wants to look it up. Um, and the poem is called Bone. But women in particular, oh, excuse me, from one who says, don't cry, you'll like it after a while. And two, who tells you, thank you after the fact and can't look at your face. To three, who pays for your breakfast and a cab home and your mother's rent. To four, who says, but you felt so good. I didn't know how to stop. To five, who says, giving your body is tough but something you do very well. To six, who smells of tobacco and says, come on, I can feel that you love this. To, to those who feel bad in the morning, yes, some feel bad in the morning. And sometimes they tell you you want it and sometimes you think that you do. Thank heavens, you're resetting, every, ever setting and resetting. How else do you sew up the tears? How else can the body survive? And then um, because so much, um, I believe every part of this is about moving toward healing and a place that feels safe. What always feels safe for me is Lucille Clifton's poem, uh, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Um, and so I'll just close out with that and say again, thank you um, for this space. Won't you celebrate with me? what I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thanks y'all. Thank you. Yeah, actually, it's funny. I had just seen that poem that you just read, Bone, 
And so I, I, I went and digging for the link. So I posted the link to that. Um, our next reader is someone I've worked with many times, starting with some poems about survivorship from my book, Head of a Gorgon, that I submitted to the journal she helms. And it's just grown from there because she's got such a generous heart and does so much work for the survivor community. Uh, Maggie Royer is a Midwestern writer, domestic violence advocate, and the founder and editor-in-chief of Persephone's Daughters, a literary and arts journal for abuse survivors. She has won numerous awards for her work and has been nominated several times for the Pushcart Prize. She thinks there is nothing better in this world than a finished poem. Hooray to that. In 2022, she received her Master of Social Work degree from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. As part of our fundraiser, Meggie is offering package three at the $50 level, which is for feedback from her on a packet of five to 10 poems. Meggie, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, Kiana, I really appreciated how vulnerable you were with the pieces that you shared and your experience. So thank you so much for that. Um, and Reagan and Olney, thank you so much for all the time you put into this Reagan, all the countless hours. So I really, really appreciate that. So I have three poems that I'll read from today. Um, the first one is called Imposter Syndrome. So I've worked in the domestic violence field for about seven years now. Um, and this poem is kind of about that experience and um, certain stories that stick in my head and what it's like to be routinely exposed to domestic violence over and over as a survivor myself. Imposter syndrome. At some point, the moon was assembled with the intention of surpassing human knowledge. Molten, unremitting, arc of construction paper against the sky. In Utah, a man shot his girlfriend just because he could. No backstory, no preceding history of which anyone was aware. No wonder the parameters of human myth are so unbounded. No wonder we think we know someone we never knew at all. How ardently you can be afraid. The moon could be a planet, inhabited, flush with our worst fears of who might reside there, or just another glow transmitting into the dark, like the deep momentary terror of a man slowing his car beside you, only to realize he's arrived at home. And the next one is called Night Terror. Um, so when I was in probably elementary school or middle school, one of our neighbors came over in the middle of the night um, in the early hours because she thought she had woken up to a man in her bedroom. Um, and that just always really stuck with me, that story. Night Terror. Once a neighbor arrived in the early hours believing she'd woken to a man in her room. What the mind conjures in sleep, it fears in day. Minutes like stones pressed into the path of an echo. What stills the body could be neurons breaking like waves or stepping from a dream like a robe. He was never there, but he was. Not the scent of him, but the shape. When it was over, the memory lasted longer than the image, caught like a fish in the mouth of the only bear that ever loved it. And my final poem, um, we were asked to find um, poems that were kind of joyful and uplifting, which was actually a difficult task for me. I think it, it kind of made me realize um, a lot of the subject matter I write about is really dark, so it was kind of hard to find one, um, but I hope that this is somewhat joyful. Um, so this poem is, I think, um, kind of about the difficulty of loneliness as a really difficult feeling to sit with, um, to sit with, and I think just it can be really lonely to be a survivor of sexual violence. So this is called 12-step program for accepting loneliness. Always the poem, even if nothing else. The deer clustered like stars in the brush. At least what's afraid of you also sees you. When there's nothing left to give, give what's left of nothing. There are so many ways the world still turns. Burrs against your hair like an embrace. Another day without your name in the obituaries. A woman's joy so abundant it misreads as hysteria. Knowing that sadness, too, is a feeling. It just feels a little worse. When the sky opens like a hand, somewhere else, a person's heart is closing. You have decades left and decades after that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maggie. Our next reader is someone I met on Twitter um, who at the time was working on scheduling events around their then forthcoming now existing collection that deals with survivorship among other things, Bird Body. I'd been thinking about today's event but hadn't shared my idea with anyone yet. 
Um, I, I do that um, when I haven't fully committed <laughs> mentally or emotionally yet. Um, but that interaction was when I decided it was time to rally folks for it, starting with Zoe. Zoe Faye Stint is a queer bicontinental poet with roots in both the French and American South. Their work has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, featured or forthcoming in places such as Southern Humanities, Ninth Letter, and Poet Lore and gathered into a chapbook, Bird Body, winner of Cordella Press's inaugural Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Prize. She lives in Ames, Iowa, where she is an MFA candidate at Iowa State University, poetry editor for the environmental journal Flyaway, and community farm volunteer. You can learn more at www.zoefaystint.com. As part of our fundraiser, Zoe's offering free packages, package six at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of Bird Body, package one at the $100 level, which is for a copy of Bird Body and feedback from them on a packet of five to 10 poems. And they're also part of package four at the $100 level, which is for a book bundle, including one copy of each of the following. You Do Not Have to Be Good by Madeline Barnes, The Truth Is by Avery Guess, Head of a Gorgon by myself, uh, the forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost by Sage Ravenwood. Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus by Lanny Stabile. And Zoe's book, Bird Body. Zoe, take it away. Oh, thank you, Reagan. Thank you, um, everyone who's taking time out of their Sundays to gather around this important community work um, of sharing story and sharing space with each other. So I feel really lucky to be in this Zoom room with y'all. Um, and thank you to Olney for being here, for, for carving the space for us and to Resilience for doing the work that y'all do daily. Um, Kiana and Maggie, that was an amazing opening. I feel really grateful for y'all's tone of um, soft, uh soft fierceness so thank you um Maggie I love that you have you have decades and then decades after that and that kind of always forward that we forever are doing um I'm going to open with a poem from Bird Body proper which still feels wild to me to have a physical book to read from um I'm going to start with a poem about how trauma lives forever inside us, right? There's no, um, there's healing alongside it, but never healing from it, I think. Um, we don't quote unquote recover from it. It lives in us. We learn to um, get on with these ghosts and these um, waking up with men beside our, beside our beds. And um, we learn to get on with them and, and figure out how to find hope and healing within that uh, without erasing it from our um, history. So this is a poem that speaks towards that called After Emailing Your Mom, another poem about it. She says she's surprised it still haunts you, brushing the needles from your hair. Says, I'm hard and wish to hell I weren't. You wonder what to write back, how to explain the hostage your nervous system has trained how the trauma lives quietly for months, careful not to tip anything over inside you until you find yourself on a date in your own car, a man's arms wrapped around you in fervor and you have gone slack. Silver grass, limp with first frost, your voice blued in its tunnel. You're sure you were in control, but your body now bowed into a ball in the driver's seat didn't get the signal. Everyone wants you to stop writing about it, this unkillable thing, enough, enough. You have been loved. Yes, you are fortunate. Don't harden yourself, baby, your mom writes back. She pulls the splinters from your teeth. Stay open. Third body. Um, feel very, very grateful for this book for helping me through so many of these moments. Um, I want to read a couple newer poems also that are siblings to this book um, that continue popping up in the world. Um, 
This next one was published in The Boiler earlier this week. So thank you to The Boiler for making space for it. Um, and it was a poem that kind of fell out of me in response to uh, Roe versus Wade uh, being overturned. Um, and it's an ode to the driftless and to persisting in this patriarchal world. Poem, I am tired. I wanna forget again about having a body. My friend cries in the HEB parking lot. My friend teaches the 19 year old on the phone with the insurance company what an IUD is. IUV, he asks. My body is a cold and rumbling fault line. Everyone with uteruses come take a walk with me. Pelicans gathering on the Mississippi's horizon like white tumors. The stink from all this rot, all these old lives turning over. After the news, within the news, I sleep alone in an unlockable Airbnb in the middle of a Wisconsin wood. No one comes for me. No one gets me pregnant. I hear the wolves too far south this year making a plan. I was given no logistics. I was given a body, sort of. I was set loose in a world with many hands, many pens, many locking devices in all the wrong places. Poem, you are getting unmanageable. In the night, when I'm near bursting and finally gather my fear up enough to let my bladder free, I brave the night and its toothiest demands. I huff and howl, stomp on the porch planks, let my body be known. I make a big show. I make a loud mess of this living. I make myself unmissable, demanding. Nobody runs away. Okay, I'm gonna breathe that one out. It always kind of takes up residence in my body. Last one is towards hope. Thank you, Reagan, for this call. Um, it's so easy to write and speak and sing towards all of the things that are fucked up in this world because look at this world. Um, but we're not going to do it without hope. We can't keep going without hope. And there's no world that we're building without dreaming towards it and hoping and singing towards that. So thank you for that. This is my last one and then I'll bow out. Little me. In Wisconsin, oh, one more note on this. Um, since writing Bird Body, Bird Body is kind of a communing with my younger self. And I've had a lot of little me poems coming out of it after writing it. Um, I think a lot of this, you know, healing-ish work is um, in, in communion with our younger selves. And so um, this is an ode to younger me. Little me. In Wisconsin, everyone waves to each other. The stray cat in front of the co-op has gotten more love in the last 20 minutes than anyone can hope for in a year. Someone's just stooped their ancient body down to meet her with their rough hands behind her welcome ear. Another has emptied a yogurt container to fill with water for her thirsty tongue. There is always someone waiting to shower you, little one. In the driftless, every valley dodged the glacier's flattening heft, and now a farm cat swats at the blackbird swooping down to greet her. We're never out of the woods. More woods, more wolves howling as you try to brave the outhouse. In the morning, all those trees remind you of their fellowship, eyes upon eyes of birches. I'm alone said nobody ever without lying. I know you're spooked, little me. I'll hold you with my two warmest hands. I'll take you to the blood root, imagine how its broken stem would light our finger pads orange, and then let it be. Someone who stayed in this cabin before us got themselves a deer. From the wood line, her ribs poke up like many white fingers. I'm not saying it's all right. I'm not saying everything or forever. I'm taking you to the Kickapoo River, a hundred watery curves, a hundred hiding spots. Press your hips into hers. 
dozens of wood anemones nodding back to you. Put your feet in the goop. Watch the fly busy your belly hair. I'll wash the dried mud from your toes this evening on the back steps, blue dawn suds between every little piggy. Take a load off, little me. Like the black cat at the store's mechanical mouth, stretch your neck out. Let the love come. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Zoe. Um, our next reader is someone whose path I crossed on Twitter as well. Uh, this was before my collection launch, but after her various creative work, both individually and with Cordella Press, dealing with survivorship caught my attention. Madeline Barnes is a writer, visual artist, and PhD candidate at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She's writing across the curriculum fellow at Baruch College and a recent graduate research fellow at the Morgan Library and Museum. Barnes serves as poetry editor at Cordella, a press that showcases the work of women and non-binary creators. Her debut full-length poetry collection, You Do Not Have to Be Good, was published by Trio House Press in 2020. She is also the author of four chapbooks, Women's Work uh, with Tolson Books, Light Experiments with Pork Belly Press, The Mark My Body Draws in Light uh, with Finishing Line Press, and The Memory Dictionary, which just came out, I feel like, week, this week, maybe last week, um, with Ethel Press. She has taught creative writing and research courses at, the New, York, uh, at New York University and Brooklyn College. Um, as part of the fundraiser, Madeline is offering free packages. Package one at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of You Do Not Have to Be Good. Package three at the $100 level, which is for an original embroidery piece, which you have to see it. If you're not on social media, like I will, I will personally email it to you because it's gorgeous. Um, and a copy of our book, You Do Not Have to Be Good. Um, and, and in fact, I'm gonna have to find, uh, I'm gonna have to upload a picture. That was the one picture I forgot. Um, and she's also part of package four at the $100 level, which is for the book bundle, um, including one copy of each of the following. You Do Not Have to Be Good, The Truth Is by Avery Guess, Head of a Gorgon by me, The Forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost by Sage Ravenwood, Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus by Lanny Stubiel, and Bird Body by Zoe Faced It. Madeline, take it away. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. <laughs> thank okay, you. perfect. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here, Reagan. I'm so inspired by you and thank you for all your hard work on this today. Uh, Maggie, Kiana, Zoe, I love your poetry and it's an honor to read after you and I'm just really excited to be here and to our audience, thank you so much for taking the time to, you know, come out and, you know, celebrate and support this cause. I really appreciate it. So um, this is the embroidery that you can get as part of um, one of the packages. It says, uh, we deserve better. It comes in a bit of a glittery hoop. Um, and yeah, it's been making this. So hopefully it goes to a good home. And um, yeah, so that's here. It's, I'm gonna start with um, a poem from You Do Not Have to Be Good. And yeah, I'll start there. So this poem is titled, What Happens? It's what she won't tell you, a man you've never met. It's something must have happened here and something did. It's having no idea what to do, a pill that makes her quiet instead of angry. It's a man telling a girl to use the word I less. It's nights spent dancing and nights spent walking in the snow, trying to start over. It's the way she has to force herself to leave the house, a wind that lifts and separates her hair. It's the doctors who side with her parents and the teachers who don't. It's fighting to believe herself no matter what. It's the fury she feels every time she has to make herself compact and the terrible immense tenderness of being held by the world. She has been dreaming of searchlights again they sweep slowly and with purpose over frozen fields. Okay, so I'm now going to move into some newer work. And um, again, thank you so much for your presence. <laughs> um, this one is called Key Rock. 
and I want to dedicate it to my family, some of whom are here. Love you guys. Um, key rock. Assignment. Find a pen, any color, and paper, any size, and draw a picture of your first home. Sketch the kitchen, the basement, attic, pantry, the hallways you were too afraid to walk after a nightmare. Was your bed by a window? If your house was surrounded by trees, what kind? When there was nowhere to go, where would people try to find you? Shade in the spaces that were yours. Circle the spaces that were not. What did you want that you didn't have? What did you have that you didn't need? What did you think about and with whom did you talk? Show me a porch, a pool, a favorite chair, a blanket, a tablecloth, blueberries, an ironing board. What did you find that was meant to be hidden? By whom were you held and by whom were you ignored? Who folded your clothes? Were the animals outside real or unreal? Where did you eat breakfast, do your homework, tell a lie just to see if you could? Describe the sound of the doorbell and, if you can, note the lights. Are they on? What did you forgive and how? Under which rock was the spare key kept? Did someone mark the key with nail polish? What color? We had one too, a decoy, a fake stone with a panel that slides open, space for two keys. It wasn't hard to locate. It led to everything we owned. I want to remember what you remember, to hide where you hide, to keep track of every detail, to know how to find you by way of soil, stone, door. Okay, and this last one, um, I want to dedicate to my mom. She is also a poet, and so I find my way into her poems and vice versa <laughs> from time to time. And uh, this is titled Self-Portrait in My Mother's clo Closing Lines. My mother is writing a poem about us. Working to finish it, she calls and says, tell me where you want to wind up. I say, together with books. She says, I like those words. In her poem, I live in a studio apartment. In real life, I live in her poem. In the afterlife, we live where? I mean, where do we want to end up? In her poem, We Swim with Elephants, an image from a dream I had months after a friend jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. Every time I crossed it, I remember how he said his main problem was not knowing how to love himself enough. Why couldn't I hear the emergency in those words? His smile, his shrug. In his last email to me, he wrote, thanks for your letter, you're a sweet girl. Years ago, my mother told me I have something every woman in our family has, resilience. This word, so close to silence, re-silence. Studies show that resilience isn't necessarily innate, it's learned, it requires practice. From whom do we learn to love ourselves enough? She calls again, hey, I just sent the final draft, let me know what you think about the ending. I want to say, it's your poem, you have to choose, but I know how she'll respond, come on. Work with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline. I love actually that that you ended on a poem with the word resilience. That's kind of like serendipitous. Um, all right. Uh, our next reader seems like someone I didn't meet on Twitter because we've chatted off to socials and done so many events together now. It feels like we should actually know each other in real life, but uh, it did start on Twitter back when Twitter was a, a better place or uh, slightly better anyway. Um, Lanny Stabile, she, her, a queer Detroiter, is the winner of Outright's 2020 chapbook competition in poetry and a back-to-back -back semifinalist for the Button Poetry Chapbook Contest. Lanny was also named a 2020 Best of the Net finalist. Her debut poetry full length, Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Seuss, uh, was published in 2021 by Cephalo Press. Her fiction debut, Something Dead and Everything with ELJ Editions was released in 2022. Find her on Twitter at Lanny Stabile or at Not A Lit Mag, where she throws random writing, contrast, or writing contests and open mics. As part of our fundraiser, Lanny is offering two packages, package five at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dogs Zeus, She's also part of package four at the $100 level, which is for the book bundle, including one copy of each of the following. You do not have to be good by Madeline Barnes. The truth is by Avery Guess, Head of Gorgon by me, 
the forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost by Sage Ravenwood. Good morning to everyone except men who named their dog Zeus and Bird Body by Zoe Faistin. Lanny, take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. At this point, I can't believe I haven't met you in person. And I just consider you my poetry sister, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, so I am going to read from Good Morning to Everyone, Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus. And I'm going to read um, some poems I, I don't often read. Um, starting with, where did it go? The Effects of Lightning on the Human Body. Um, and this is a found poem with the substitution of lightning for rape. Um, throughout this book, you'll see lightning come, come back and, and just kind of reverberate. So the effects of lightning on the human body. Like a gunshot, it causes both exits and entrance wound, marking the victim. White, hot substances burn, clothing shredded, shoes and socks thrown off. Many survivors do not remember being struck. The only evidence is burnt, displaced clothing and marks along the body. It will cook brain cells, rendering them useless. Memory issues, trouble with concentration, severe headaches, all of which last decades after the initial strike. And then um, I'm gonna read five really little poems um, that there are five different types of lightning. So each one of them is gonna be a type of lightning. One, side flash. Lightning is a stranger in a bar propped up at the end of a pool table, his eyes on you, his hands on his zipper, returning even after the bouncer says, hey man, take that shit outside. Two, ground currents. Lightning is an afternoon nap with a cousin, waking to curious hands yawning along your stomach, wondering how long you've been asleep. Three, conduction. Lightning is two hands cradling hips while Casey Battaglia and Ludacris lick through club speakers, an erection nudging the small of your back. Four, streamers. Lightning is slamming your seven-year-old body against a six-foot Joe Dumars poster and an older boy with virile insistence stealing your first kiss. And number five, direct strike. Lightning is a friend offering solace with a tongue between your legs. And when he repositions himself, you say, I'm not really sure. And he says, too late. Um, and I did, I did do the assignment and I chose a, a happy piece or a, an uplifting piece to end on. Um, but it's me, and so it's not the happiest, but it is interesting, um, and it certainly takes what um, women and non-binary people have experienced and kind of like flips the tables, turns the tables. So this is from Something Dead in Everything. It's actually a very short fiction piece. It's called A Family Debate. I just, I just don't see the issue, Dottie said, propping her bunion feet up on the ottoman. I paid for it. Him, her sister Marcia corrected. You paid for him. Dottie waved an uncaring hand and recrossed her ankles. Whatever. I don't care if Parliament signed it into law, Marcia continued to press. Men aren't things. They're people like us. Dottie picked up a tall glass of lemonade that had been left to sweat on the stiff back of a blonde man. She liked to call it her side table. Dottie sipped and once again recrossed her ankles. The ottoman groaned. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Reagan, for putting this all together. It's It's been amazing and you're incredible. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lanny. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear those five pieces together. Uh, that was awesome. Um, 
All right, our next reader is someone whose path Cross mine, I believe, when we were talking about goth stuff um, online, <laughs> but it goes far deeper than that because she's also an incredible poet who writes about various types of survivorship. Um, Sage Ravenwood is a deaf Cherokee woman residing in upstate New York with her two rescue dogs, Bajarki and Yazi, and her one eyed cat, Max. She is an outspoken advocate against animal cruelty and domestic violence. Her work can be found in I Gotta Take a Breath. The Thames Review, Contrary, Literary, Grain, Sund Sundress Press Anthology, The Familiar Wild, On Dogs and Poetry, The Rumpus, Lit Quarterly, Massachusetts Review, Savant Garde, Anomaly, Rivermouth Review, Native Skin Lit, Santa Clara Review, The Normal School, U City Review, Punk Noir, Janus Literary, Jelly Bucket, Cor Colorado Review, Pangeris, Prism International, 128 Lit, A Gathering of the Tribes, Ponder Review, and even more. Her book, Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost, is forthcoming from Gallaudet University Press this fall. As part of our fundraiser, Sage is offering four packages. Package four at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of the forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost, which will be sent once, obviously, it's printed and available. Um, package two at the $50 level, which is for a beautiful set of beaded earrings, and that picture I do have, so I will drop that in the chat. Um, package four at the $50 level, which is for feedback from Sage on a packet of five to 10 poems. And she's also part of package four at the $100 level, which is for the book bundle, including one copy of each of the following, You Do Not Have to Be Good by Madeline Barnes, The Truth Is by Avery Guess, Head of a Gorgon by me. The forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost. Good morning to everyone except men who named their dog Zeus by Lanny Stabile and Bird Body by Zoe Faced In. Um, because Sage is deaf, uh, her reading is recorded. So I'm going to share my screen to start that video now. What we've done is we've paired her uh, her audio with um, the, the actual words. So hopefully I'm going to get this to work and not mess this up. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see. Um, share screen. Please somebody tell me if I'm messing this up. Um, okay. Oh, CEO, I'm Sage Raven. I'm Jeff, so if you could be patient with me, I'll be reading three poems for you. How do I live a rapist? Girl, babe, might we be magic? How do I live a rapist? His living haunted like the dead, even after his actual death. The carefree girl I was, the woman I become, side by side, staring down at his gravestone. All three of us no longer were in the same place. Death cheated. We can't get a stain off our skin. Every breath we take trembles. Leaves when surface an open grave. We stopped screaming for daddy long after our throats gave out. She tracks arms outstretched. I miss her. That part of me who never had a chance to test her wings. I want the pieces of her buried with him to sing to him in his grave. Everything that her does becomes a ghost. Girl, babe. Florida's salt tang wind sings in December. Her stiff fingers and delicate untangle knots. No moon, no light to see by. Searching out torn bat holes for free, I feel. This cast that was handmade. His constant bragging told her so. In between belched insults, slow and lazy. There is an efficient license for luxury. 
She pulls the net up to her chin, sinking down into my echo. Fine gray sand, climb deeper like a burrow in mole crab. Why choose a girl and not her brother? She needs more sinkers to drown. Thick shadows hide inside these small hours. An angry kick yanks her neck cloak free. Shaken, girl bait loose from its moorings. The rock face is jagged at shields, slipping close. Below the water lets spoon against the pier. Her shoulders familiar with a cast net singing white. She watches the smack of her dance for fish. Net looped over his left arm, lead rope and right, shoreline walks. Frogs written stone barriers wet. Receding waves suckling boot waders. She hears the sinker's click gather throat. The net opens, a jellyfish swallowing night. She can always tell by the splash, like a child who can't swim slapping water. It's never a good throw. The gal always wins. Listen to the wind's bellowing laughter, encouraging, pretend dad dies a child's flame. Octana, the antler's serpent, stroke it, his ego. Everything goes dark for a girl used as chum. To scale her with a blunt knife before filling it. <sighs> Let lightning strike, sand fired into hard glass. She can't even shatter. An empty stomach needs food. His is full of her splinters. Might we be magic? No sight of hand shakes up our sleeves. Luminescent stars glints between tree boughs. Bob waves pretended to be early morning dew. Grab a crunching under footsteps, remembering home. Long evening walks, sky on fire, days dying embers. Discovering lost letters tucked in books when an argument still simmers, when everything that can be said is in the eyes. A season of blood and dead things go, burnt leaves, colder days and shorter nights, hurried steps, warm fires, dank rock. Never feeling more alive, hedonistic, the sun's blazing gallop across daybreak, and half pursued of insomnia hazards. Crab apple trees, windswept petals, reminding us old man winter snores. Rain collected all our tears, rippling into a river's exhale. A red tailed hawk's winged shadow playing with sunlight, arms holding love close and tight in a hug, even when they are empty. All the unspoken things held in a smile across the room. Sun-kissed daydreams behind orange eyelids. Storm chasing kids on bikes. Lightning in their veins, thunderstruck pedaling. Wizened, toothless grins, accompanying a playful wind. Street signs daring you to pick a never been road. The slow roll of a car driving by a deer, captured in his gaze behind the, beside the highway. The women who run with beasts, the men who swim their deaths. Forest creatures breathing life into dead trees. All the road, animalia of our awareness, holding life captives. What magic is this? Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you, Sage, uh, for your tremendous work. Um, 
our next reader is someone I connected with actually so long ago on Facebook, I can't actually remember uh, how at this point, but I eagerly awaited the release of her full length collection about survivorship, the truth is, and I was not disappointed. Avery Guess is a Jewish queer neuro neurodivergent writer whose work focuses on disability, particularly mental illness and survivorship. Her debut full length poetry collection, The Truth Is, was published by Black Lawrence Press in 2019. Avery was named a 2015 uh, Poetry Fellow from the National Endowment for the Arts. She has received grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women, where she now works full time as a grants program manager and the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund. Avery received an MFA from Southern Illinois University and is working toward her PhD at the University of South Dakota. She lives in Louisville with her dog Quigley. As part of our fundraiser, Avery is offering five packages. Package two at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of The Truth Is, but there are two copies available on this, uh, which is very cool. So it's actually two, pa two separate packages. Um, package five at the $50 level, which is for a copy of The Truth Is and feedback on a packet of three poems uh, with a six page maximum. Pa uh, package two at the $100 level, which is for a copy of The Truth Is and feedback from Avery on a packet of five to 10 poems with a 20 page maximum. And she's part of package four at the $100 level, which is for the book bundle, including one copy of each of the following. You Do Not Have to Be Good by Madeline Barnes, The Truth Is, Head of a Gorgon by me, uh, the forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost by Sage Ravenwood, Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus by Lanny Stabile, and Bird Body by Zoe Faye Stin. Avery, uh, take it away. No, I'm unmuted. It's amazing. Yay. Oh, shoot. I lost the, hold on just a moment, folks. Sorry. All right, there we go. Um, so first, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's read so far. My heart is like literally in my throat right now. Um, these have just been very powerful. Um, so thank you for sharing such strong and vulnerable work with everyone. Um, I want to thank Reagan. She has put so much work into making this fundraiser success. I don't know if we could get like a round of applause for her in the chat or wherever, but I mean, just amazing amount of work, y'all. Um, thanks to Olney and um, Kith for donating packages. I'm just so honored to be part of this fundraising effort for the work that Resilience does. And just thanks to everyone who's come out to listen and donate. Um, so I'm going to read three poems. Poets have to tell you how many poems they're going to read. It's poet math. Um, I'm not sure why we do it. Maybe just to not scare people. <laughs> but here's the first one. Um, and they're all from my book. Uh, the truth is, this is her childhood home. The flamingo feathers its nest with sawgrass and stones. The rabbit that visits each day at four is found dead next to the monkey's cage. The father's hand is far too fond of the daughter's breast, her bedroom carpet the color of just shed blood, and the mother whacks the daughter 100 times each night with a brush so her hair shines brighter than the Big Dipper in the April sky. The stars are always there glaring down at her during the day. She sees them each time she faints and each time she turns a life light off in her bedroom, God's eyes bore through her and pin her to the bed where she screams for help. She dreams of leaving, even her turtle ran away. True story, Herman left me after my cousins came to visit, still not sure why. Um, but he was a little tiny snapping turtle. It was very sad. I missed him. Hold on. I did not. I marked the pages, but Lord only knows I can't. Um, there we go. Can't make the book operate. All right. This next one is Two Objects and a Girl. It's an ekphrastic poem. So it's based on two pieces of art by the surrealist Merritt Oppenheim. Um, the first one is called Object. It's a gazelle fur covered teacup, saucer, and spoon. And the second one is uh, whatever the French words are for a bicycle seat with bees. Um, that's, the, that's the second one. It's a photograph of a bicycle seat filled with bees. Um, so here we go. Two objects and a girl. One. At breakfast, the girl spits out gazelle fur with each sip of tea. It clings to the walls, her saliva like glue, gets stuck between her teeth. At night, she coughs up more hairballs than the cat. 
She's all instinct and scent, smells too much of her father. He's been sniffing around. Her fur has come in and her ears grow long. She's skittish, on guard. The girl's mother hires a dressmaker to cover her daughter's changed form, but the woman doesn't have patterns that fit the four-legged creature standing before her. She advises the mother to fashion a bed out of straw, make the girl comfortable. What else can you do? The girl knows, but her long tongue can't wrap itself around the word flea. The other girls call her wild and the teacher leashes her to the treadmill and gym. Over and over, she runs the same course, clenches her teeth against tongue and tastes blood. Two, one day, just like that, the girl sheds her fur. Her ears recede until they can no longer be seen and she starts humming a lot. Her head narrows at the top and widens at the base and when struck sounds a hollow thunk. Inside, a constant drone. She walks as though traveling through liquid gone thick and viscous. At night, when the girl's father comes to her bed, he complains of stings. She pedals her bike around town. Flowers bend toward her as she passes and she aches to bathe in their yellow dust. The girl is last sighted near the bus station. The people who saw her that day swear she shimmered like a hot road mirage. She was there and then she wasn't and the seat of her bicycle was swathed in bees. Okay, and the last one, I promised you just three, okay. Um, so this last poem is one that I wrote about how we can seem to be made smaller by trauma, but all that smallness can just gather together and become something so much bigger. This one is called Serotony, and it's uh, partially thanks to Ada Lamone. I was in a class of hers, a uh, workshop of hers when she, um, when I wrote this based on, I'm not sure, probably a prompt of hers. Um, Serotony. In the deep forest of my body, a pine cone, seeds packed tight, patient as the universe before that big bang. Imagine all those comets and planets, all the stars and dark matter in the smallest waiting room. My heart, my pine cone, be ready. When that freeing fire blazes toward you at the first sign of scorched earth, first forth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avery. Um, so that leaves me. Um, <laughs> and of course, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, my debut full length collection, I'm going to read a bit from uh, Head of a Gorgon, reimagines the myth of Medusa in contemporary times and examines her tale of sexual violence through a survivor centric uh, feminist lens. I'm especially happy to offer the six packages that I popped into the chat um, as part of this fundraiser. Um, package three at the $25 level, which is for a signed copy of the collection, Head of a Gorgon. Package four at the $100 level, which is for the book bundle, including one copy of each of the following. You Do Not Have to Be Good by Madeline Barnes. The Truth Is by Avery Guest. Head of a Gorgon. The forthcoming Everything That Hurt Us Becomes a Ghost by Sage Ravenwood. Good morning to everyone except men who named their dogs Zeus by Lanny Stabile and Bird Body by Zoe Faiston. And we got some pricier packages, but uh, some, in well, ones I think are interesting or hope are interesting. Um, package one at the $250 level is for consultation and guidance on author-led book promotion, including how to build a book press kit, marketing plan, social media strategy, and more, since many of us uh, handle that aspect, not just the writing, um, but also the promotion of books. Uh, package three at the $250 level is for a mystery book bundle of 20 titles from my personal collection. Package one at the $500 level is for a poetry manuscript consultation, including feedback on one full length poetry collection or chat book unpublished and or in progress, along with preparation guidance and submission strategies. Um, and my personal piece de resistance is package one at the $1,000 level, which is a poetry book PR package, including a PR consultation a book review that I would actually write on the book, um, an interview that I would do with the author and publish both of these obviously, and a minimum of 10 leads for podcasts and reading venues to pursue um, to publicize the book. 
For that one, you do have to have a poetry book uh, forthcoming out or, uh, or out no earlier than 2022. Um, and so with that, um, I will read some poems from Head of a Gorgon. And this one is called Seeing Stars. Um, and it's broken into uh, five sections. As a child, I learned this trick, pressed fingertips to closed eyelids, made the stars appear. When I opened my eyes, blurred darkness, who's there? I couldn't speak what I feared most, believed speaking made real, summoned things into being again. First grade amnesiac, late night TV, snowy stars sizzling, hoping light would scare anything waiting in darkness to pray. Yearning to learn the right kind of kiss, a blazing in my chest, a whole universe I could spin, hold in like my breath until my dizzy head, love drunk, could overwrite the past hissing in my skull. No wonder no boy will love you, look at you, you don't listen, she said. Then mother's knuckly yanks raked the lengths of my hair, fingers treading neck, nails puncturing flesh. But no matter how bright, stars are always quiet. Couldn't save me from falling numb. Reminded me to cloak my words, left me dumb. There's nothing extraordinary about housing stars, silence tragedies adorning the engulfing night. To think people strive to learn their names, care about naming them, always waiting for their stupid distant light to reach as if that touch is kind. Just speaking of them sets them in their searing motion and from there, no escape from their twisted elliptical fates. Listen, I'm carving a new star in this darkening skin. I create it as easily as I say the words. I search for some hero, some Orion without a loose belt who will sing the lullaby that can put me to sleep, who can sing the song that brings me back to dream. But can he exist without all those rivets of stars? Who's there? still waiting for the night to rise. This one's more medusa -y. Um, Imagine the stones. Relics. The first to set his sights on me after tried hymns, but the dissonance struck too similar. His chords always choked. The next pledged devotion, but another's portrait dropped from his pocket his fingers perpetually outstretched. Then one came who tried to hide beneath my pain, but he didn't see the glass was already cracked. His fractures, natural. But it's been so long and there have been so many. It's hard now to recall how it first felt to witness the twist seize skin like ivy, realizing I was the root. For a while, I'll admit I could live with hunting under studies. That seemed the best I could do, marked for this dark art my nemesis too clever, avoiding this perimeter. I'd settle for some substitute for justice, torment other gluttons ignoring the warnings. I once wished a tender face could exist with me, but now I know better. Men keep advancing, the same gaze awaits, everything petrifies. This is no life, no one wishes for kisses that shock white. This is part of a shattered sonnet sequence, um, which is towards the second half of the book. This one's Watershed. I know what it is to be broken by others, all parts beaten and lost to another's, as if ocean rules the sand it casts. And when I realized it had, I wept. But when I wept, my tears split sea surface and I claimed that throne became the god of salt, water, shapes, sounds, failing, falling, rising again. I broke that ocean with a rage I couldn't contain. Now it undulates with my tongue, delivers a hymn binding all other sound to it, even the birds overhead. Some men thought they'd be able to rule this water forever, but none can stop this sound. When my ocean first spoke, the serpents nested in my head recoiled. This is Genosco. Sun dances, or dust dances in the sun now, so tiny the air meets it as sea. 
and the grains gild the leaves of my plants. As I water them, I recall how a woman I once knew used to keep strings of pearls just like the one I now have. It struck me so suddenly, finally feeling one of the tendrils. Despite the distance, she and I shared life. I might just be tending to her garden. Then I recognized man's world would persist with its spinning. I recognized not all our sisters have been able to seize peace. I recognized countless questions remain with answers I must continue to seek. So one of the things um, that I haven't done until recently was write a happy poem. <laughs> so kind of touching on something that Maggie said earlier on in the reading. Um, and this happy poem is for my fiance and it's about my fiance and I have one of those, uh, which I have to admit when I was writing Head of a Gorgon, I didn't see for myself. Um, and so it's kind of, uh, it's, it's a, a nice arc, I guess, as a, as a poet and as a, as a Gorgon. Um, this is called, this is not a love poem. This is not a love poem, the same way the curvaceous tan can-can leg narrowing to a stiletto-ish tip in Magritte's painting is not a pipe, especially when you look at it sideways, but mostly because despite its trick of highlights, it lacks a dimension that can be grasped. And what could ever be real without, at the very least, the potential for embrace? Truth be told, even 12 years in, I bet you'd readily recall our first. Meanwhile, my brain would have to ramble through its usual associative maze. For example, by that specific kind of classic, not only for the pickle, but also the bride. See also ancient cheerleading routines, punishing kick lines, recollections of cramps appearing out of nowhere that must drop everything be attended to. It's summer again, and it's Vegas. Still, I see you sweeping desiccated leaves off our pots, the driveway, the street. What man does this but him, I think? And is that some type of love? Magritte had something to say about the treachery of images, but then he painted that brown deal and told us only what it wasn't. Like that time on the strip when David Copperfield summoned you up to him on the darkened stage and between a car floating, whoosh, dropping, and that steaming mechanical avalanche, he spewed some mumbo jumbo that made you disappear. But I knew you still had to exist somewhere within that palette of metallic haze and black. Even now, watching you through our window, I know the meaning of heat that warps the asphalt to mirage, certain the sweat's collecting on the freckled slope of your nose, the last stop on your body before warning turns emergency. When you come back inside, your legs will need chartreuse juice, and I will have a glass filled for you. Later, after the pain evaporates, I'll plop on the couch next to you, drape my thighs across yours, careful not to snag fabric with my heels. I'll wiggle my black patent feet, say, do you remember when we first started dating? A corner of your lips will curve into not a pipe before the other side follows. And this is an answer of at least a thousand sounds, but in a language my brain's too gherkin to contain. I suppose there's plenty to say about the treachery of words. For example, here, where I tried to make them tell it straight, this story about you. See also you, still at best a silhouette, waiting for some secret cue, a magician, dissipating smoke. So um, we're gonna bring back Annalise for today's grounding ceremony. So Annalise, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name's Annalise, I'm an art therapist here at Resilience. So thank you for inviting me into your space. And also thanks again to all of the readers for letting us share in different pieces of your story and also letting us hold those stories with you. We support you and we relate to you. So thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna lead us through a grounding practice. We're gonna start off by doing orienting to tend to our bodies. I heard a couple of people mention say that our bodies felt some type of way in response to these words. So we're gonna try to tend to our bodies with orienting first. And then we're gonna do, um, we're gonna use our imagination to do a guided visualization to help hopefully feel a little bit of rest and a little bit of comfort. So if at any point um, the grounding practice I lead us through is not your jam, just feel free to mute me and do something else that feels more comfortable and more soothing to you. You could just take some breaths on your own or do a little stretch, that's fine too. 
Um, but all right, let's go ahead and start. Our bodies might have been in the same spot for a while, so you can readjust if you need to. When you find a comfortable spot, I'm going to ask you to reach out and touch a couple of things around you. So I'm going to ask you to reach out and touch three items that are near you. And as you're doing that, you can take your time observing these objects and you can pick them up and touch them more than one time. But I want you to start to ask yourself about the qualities of those different items that you chose. So are those objects soft to the touch or are they hard? What's their weight like? Are some of them heavy or some of them light? Do any of them have a temperature to them? Maybe some feel really cool to the touch. Maybe some are more neutral. You might be able to notice the different textures that these items have. And you can also challenge yourself to think of the specific colors that you see too. So are you seeing red or is it a deep burgundy? Try to be descriptive there. Are you seeing blue or is it a bright turquoise? So take some time to really observe those three objects, touch them and notice them. And then once you've had enough time to do that, now you can find a new place to pause from that movement. We're gonna invite some stillness here and we'll go into our visualization. So if it helps you to imagine things, you can close your eyes and follow along. Or if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, try to just maybe lower your gaze and look at something in the room that's not gonna be moving. Just have a, a gentle focus somewhere in the room. All right, so now I want you to take a breath here as we're in this place of stillness and start to visualize, start to picture a comfortable atmosphere, whatever that means to you. And think to yourself, start to describe what does your comfortable space look like to you? Are there any objects around you? If so, what are they? How are your senses engaged in this space? Is there anything you can hear? Are there any sounds nearby? Is there anything you can feel? Is there a temperature here? What can you see here? How bright is it? How much light is there? Are you inside? Are you outside? And also think about the colors that might be present in your comfortable atmosphere. Try to have just as much detail as we just practiced as you notice this environment and really visualize yourself in this atmosphere. Notice how you feel in the atmosphere and what is around you. And once you've had a chance to do that, now I want you to identify one thing in your comfortable atmosphere that you can bring into your day today in a practical way. So find one element of your comfortable atmosphere that you can bring into the rest of your day. Maybe if your space was really warm and comfortable, maybe you'll sit with a fuzzy blanket later today. Maybe if your place had a certain smell, you can sit next to a candle to have that scent and to have that warmth. But whatever it is, end here by briefly noting a small plan to incorporate that comfort into your day this evening. And once you have your small plan, you can end with one last calming breath here. And then find a place to end this practice, hanging on to your small plan. 
can slowly introduce some movements back into the body as we come out of that stillness. Maybe wiggle the toes or wiggle the fingers and then slowly blink open our eyes if we had them closed. And we'll find a place to pause here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Annalise. That's tremendous. Um, such a lovely, lovely way to wrap up the event. Um, please be on the lookout for the video recording that we're going to share um, if you'd like. And again, the fundraiser is going to remain open through the month of April if you haven't yet donated or are in the position to do so uh, right now, but would like to. The link will be live, um, I think, probably until May 1st. So um, I just want to say thanks again to all of the readers who joined me today. It was just such an incredible honor to, to be here with you and to hear your work. Um, I, I was so busy that I didn't get to, to respond to everybody in the chat and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I did what I could to take it all in. And it, it's I, I'm familiar with all of your work, thankfully. So um, I, I, I just I adore all of you. And I'm just really glad that we got to share it today. Um, Thank you also to Olney uh, for hosting us and uh, giving us this space, providing this space and um, for the packages that you're offering so generously. Uh, Kith as well for your auction packages and of course to Resilience um, for the tremendous work you're doing uh, for survivors and especially Annalise for the lovely grounding ceremony. Um, thank you of course to everybody who joined us today um, and, and donated already to this uh, important cause. Um, thank you for helping to facilitate others healing and sharing the space. Um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at headofagorgon at gmail.com if you have questions or want to connect. Um, otherwise, that, that brings us to the end of the event. Um, so please have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you all so much.